Metamorphosis by Ovid, Book the Fourth, the story of Alsatho and her sisters. Yet still Alsatho perverse remains, and Bacchus still in all his rights, disdains. Too rash and madly bold, she bids him prove himself a god, nor owns the son of Jove. Her sisters too unanimous agree, faithful associates in impiety. Be this solemn feast, the priest had said, be with each mistress unemployed, each maid, with skins of beasts, your tender limbs and clothes, and with an ivy crown adorn your brows, the leafy thyrsus high in triumph bear, and give your locks to wanton in the air. These rites profane the holy seer foreshadowed, a morning people and a vengeful god. Matrons and pious wives obedient show, Distaffs and wool half spun, away they throw. Then incense burn, and Bacchus thee adore. Or lovest thou Anisius, or layest more? O oh, doubly got, O oh, doubly born, they sung. Thou mighty Bromius, hail from lightning sprung. Hail, Theon, Elilius, each name is thine. Or listen, parent of the genial vine. Iacus, Evan, loudly they repeat, and not one Grecian attribute forget, which to thy praise great deity belong, stilled justly liber in the Roman song. Eternity of youth is thine. Enjoy years, rowled on years, yet still a blooming boy. In heaven thou shinest with a superior grace. Conceal thy horns, and tis a virgin's face. Thou taughtest the tawny Indian to obey, and Ganges smoothly flowing own thy sway. Lysurgis, Pentheus, equally profane, by thy just vengeance equally were slain. By thee, the Tuscans, who conspired to keep thee captive, plunged, and cut with fins the deep, with painted reins all glittering from afar, the spotted lynxes proudly draw thy car, around the Bacchae and the satyrs throng, behind, Silenus, drunk, lags slow along, on his dull ass he nods from side to side, forbears to fall, yet half forgets to ride, still, at thy near approach, applause is loud, are heard, with the yellings of the female crowd, timbrels and boxen pipes with mingled cries, swell up in sounds confused and rend the skies, come, Bacchus, come, propitious, all implore, and act thy sacred orgies o'er and o'er. But Minius's daughters, while these rites were paid, at home impertinently busy stayed. Their wicked tasks they ply with various art, and through the loom the sliding shuttle dart, or at the fire to comb the wool they stand, or twirl the spindle with a dexterous hand. Guilty themselves, they force the guiltless in. Their maids who share the labor share the sin. At least one sister cries, who nimbly knew to draw nice threads and wind the finest clue while others idly rove and gods revere their fancied gods they know not who or where let us whom pallas taught her better art still working cheer with mirthful chat our hearts and to deceive the time let me prevail with each by turns to tell other antique tale she said her sisters liked the humour well and smiling bade her the first story tell but she a while profoundly seemed to muse, perplexed amid variety to choose, and knew not whether she should first relate the poor Desertus and her wondrous fate. The Palestines believe it to a man, and show the lake in which her scales began. Or, if she rather should the daughter sing, who in the hoary verge of life took wing, who soared from earth and dwelt in towers on high, and now a dove she flits along the sky. Oh, how lewd, Nais, when her lust was cloyed, to fishes turned the youths. She had enjoyed, by powerful verse and herbs, effect most strange. At last the changer shared herself the change. Or how the tree which once white berries bore still crimson bears, since stained with crimson gore. The tree was new, she likes it, and begins to tell the tale. And as she tells, she spins. 
the story of Pyramus and Thisbe. In Babylon, where first her queen for state raised walls of brick magnificently great, lived Pyramus and Thisbe, lovely pair. He found no eastern youth his equal there, and she beyond the fairest nymph was fair. A closer neighborhood was never known, though to the houses yet the roof was one. Acquaintance grew, though acquaintance they improved, to friendship. Friendship ripened into love. Love had been crowned, but impotently mad. What parents could not hinder they forbade? For with fierce flames young Pyramus still burned, and grateful Thisbe flames as fierce returned. Aloud in words their thoughts they dare not break, but silent stand, and silent looks can speak. The fire of love, the more it is suppressed, the more it glows and rages in the breast. When the division wall was built, a chink was left, the cement unobserved to shrink. So slight the cranny that it still had been for centuries unclosed because unseen. But oh, what thing so small, so secret lies, which scapes have formed for love a lover's eyes. Even in this narrow chink they quickly found a friendly passage for a trackless sound. Safely they told their sorrows and their joys in whispered murmurs and a dying noise by turns to catch each other's breath they strove and sucked in all the balmy breeze of love. Oft, as on different sides they stood, they cried, Malicious wall, thus lovers to divide. Suppose thou should, a while, give us place to lock and fasten in a close embrace. But if too much to grant so sweet a bliss, indulge at least the pleasure of a kiss. We scorn ingratitude, to thee we know, this safe conveyance of our minds we owe. Thus they their vain petition did renew, till night, and then they softly sighed adieu. But first they strove to kiss, and that was all. Their kisses died untasted on the wall. Soon as the morn had o'er the stars prevailed, and warmed by Phoebus, flowers their dews exhaled. The lovers to their well-known place return. Alike they suffer, and alike they mourn. At last, their parents they resolve to cheat, if to deceive in love be called deceit, to steal by night from home, and thence unknown, to seek the fields, and quit the unfaithful town. But to prevent their wandering in the dark, they both agree to fix upon a mark, a mark that could not their designs expose. The tomb of Ninus was the mark they chose. There, they might rest secure beneath the shade, which bows with snowy fruit encumbered made. A widespread mulberry its rise had took just on the margin of a gurgling brook. Impatient for the friendly dusk, they stay and chide the slowness of departing day. In western seas down sunk at last the light. From western seas uprose the shades of night. The loving Thisbe even prevents the hour with cautious silence. She unlocks the door, and veils her face, and marching through the gloom swiftly arrives at the assignation tomb. For still the fearful sex can fearless prove, boldly they act if spirited by love, when lo, a lioness rushed o'er the plain, grimly besmeared with blood of oxen slain, and watch the dire sight new horrors brought to slake her thirst the neighboring spring she sought, which by moon, when trembling Thisbe spies, winged with her fear, swift as the wind, she flies, and in a cave recovers from her fright, but dropped her veil, confounded in her flight. When sated with repeated draughts again, the queen of beasts scoured back along the plain, she found the veil, and mouthing it all o'er with bloody jaws, the lifeless prey she tore. The youth, who could not cheat his guard so soon, late came, and noted by the glimmering moon some savage feet, new printed on the ground. His cheeks turned pale, his limbs no vigor found. But when advancing on the veil he spied, disdained with blood and ghastly torn, he cried, One night shall death to two young lovers give, but she deserved unnumbered years to live. 
"'Tis I am guilty, I have thee betrayed. "'Who came not early as my charming maid? "'Whatever slew thee, I the cause remain. "'I named, and fix the place where thou wast slain. "'Ye lions from the neighbouring dens repair. "'Pity the wretch, this impious body tear. "'But cowards thus for death can idly cry. "'The brave still have it in their power to die. "'Then, to the appointed tree, he hastes away.' The veil first gathered, though all rent it lay. The veil all rent, yet still itself endears. He kissed, and kissing, washed it with his tears. Though rich, he cried with many a precious stain. Still, from my blood, a deeper tincture gain. Then, in his breast, his shining sword he drowned, and fell supine. Extended on the ground, as out again the blade lie dying drew, outspun the blood, and streaming upwards flew. So if a conduit pipe air burst you saw, swift spring the gushing waters through the floor. Then spouting in a bow, they rise on high, and a new fountain plays amid the sky. The berries stained with blood began to show a dark complexion, and forgot their snow. While fattened with the flowing gore, the root was doomed forever to a purple fruit. Meantime, poor Thisbe feared so long she stayed, her lover might suspect a perjured maid. Her fright scarce o'er, she strove the youth to find with ardent eyes which spoke an ardent mind. Already in his arms she hears him sigh at her destruction, which was once so nigh. The tomb, the tree, but not the fruit she knew. The fruit she doubted for its altered hue. Still, as she doubts, her eyes a body found, quivering in death and gasping on the ground. She started back, the red her cheeks forsook, and every nerve with thrilling horrors shook. So trembles the smooth surface of the seas, if brushed o'er gently with a rising breeze. But when her view her bleeding love confessed, she shrieked, she tore her hair, she beat her breast. She raised the body and embraced it round, and bathed with tears unfeigned the gaping wound. Then her warm lips to the cold face applied. And it is thus, ah, thus we meet. She cried, My Pyramus, ah, speak ere tis too late. My Pyramus, whence sprung thy cruel fate? I, thy own Thisbe, but one word implore, one word thy Thisbe never asked before. At Thisbe's name awaked, he opened wide his dying eyes. With dying eyes he tried on her to dwell, but closed them slow and died. The fatal cause was now at last explored, her veil she knew, and saw his sheathless sword. From thy own hand thy ruin thou hast found, she said, but love first taught that hand to wound. Even I, for thee as bold a hand can show, and love, which shall as true direct the blow, I will against the woman's weakness strive, and never thee, lamented youth, survive. The world may say I caused, alas, thy death, but saw thee breathless, and resigned my breath. Fate, though it conquers, shall no triumph gain. Fate that divides us still divides in vain. Now both our cruel parents hear my prayer, my prayer to offer for us both I dare. Oh, see our ashes in one urn confined, whom love at first and fate at last has joined. The bliss you envied is not our request. Lovers, when dead, may sure together rest. Thou tree, where now one lifeless lump is laid, Ere long our two shalt cast a friendly shade. Still, let our loves from thee be understood, Still witness in thy purple fruit our blood. She spoke, and in her bosom plunged the sword, All warm and reeking from its slaughtered lord. The prayer which dying Thisbe had preferred, Both gods and parents with compassion heard. The whiteness of the mulberry soon fled, and ripening saddened in a dusky red, while both their parents their lost children mourn, and mix their ashes in one golden urn. Thus did the melancholy tale conclude, and a short silent interval ensued. 
The next in birth unloosed her artful tongue, and drew attentive all the sister throng. The story of Lucatho and the Sun. The sun, the source of light by beauty's power, once amorous grew. Then heard the sun's amour, Venus and Mars, with his far-piercing eyes, this god first spied, this god first all things spies. Stung at the sight and swift on mischief bent, to haughty Juno's shapeless son he went. The goddess and her god gallant betrayed, and told the cuckold where their pranks were played. Poor Vulcan soon desired to hear no more. He dropped his hammer, and he shook all o'er. Then courage takes, and full of revengeful ire, he heaves the bellows and blows fierce the fire. From liquid brass, though sure, yet subtle snares he forms. And next a wondrous net prepares, drawn with such curious art, so nicely sly. Unseen the mashes cheat the searching eye, not half so thin their webs the spiders weave, which the most wary buzzing prey deceive. These chains, obedient to the touch, he spread, in secret foldings o'er the conscious bed. The conscious bed again was quickly pressed, by the fond pair in lawless raptures blessed. Mars wondered at his Cytherea's charms, more fast than ever locked within her arms, while Vulcan the ivory doors unbarred with care, then called the gods to view the sportive pair. The gods thronged in and saw an open day when Mars and Beauty's queen all naked lay. Oh, shameful sight of shameful that we name, which gods with envy viewed and could not blame, but for the pleasure wished to bear the shame. Each deity with laughter tired departs, yet all still laughed at Vulcan in their hearts. Through heaven the news of this surprisal run, but Venus did not thus forget the sun. He, who stolen transports idly had betrayed, by a betrayer was in kind repaid. What now avails, great God, thy piercing blaze, that youth and beauty, and those golden rays? Thou who canst warm this universe alone, feel it's now a warmth more powerful than thy own, and those bright eyes which all things should survey, know not from fair, look at though to stray. The lamp of light, for human good designed, is to one virgin niggardly confined. Sometimes too early rise thy eastern beams, sometimes too late they set in western streams. Tis then her beauty thy swift course delays, and gives to winter skies long summer days. Now in thy face thy lovesick mind appears, and spreads through impious nations empty fears. For when thy beamless head is wrapped in night, poor mortals tremble in despair of light. "'Tis not the moon that o'er thee casts a veil, "'tis love alone which makes thy look so pale. "'Lucatho is grown thy only care, "'not Phaeton's fair mother now is fair, "'the youthful Rhodos moves no tender thought, "'and beauteous Porsa is at last forgot, "'fond Clytie, scorned yet loved, "'and sought thy bed. "'Even then thy heart for other virgins bled.' Lucat, though, has all thy soul possessed, and chased each rival passion from thy breast. To this bright nymph, Eurynome gave birth in the blessed confines of the spicy earth, excelling others she herself beheld by her own blooming daughter, far excelled. The sire was Orchimus, whose vast command, the seventh from Belus, ruled the Persian land. Deep in cool vales beneath the Hesperian sky, for the sun's fiery steeds the pastures lie. Ambrosia there they eat, and thence they gain new vigor, and their daily toils sustain. While thus on heavenly food the coursers fed, and night around her gloomy empire spread. The god assumed the mother's shape and air, and passed unheeded to his darling fair. Close by a lamp, with maids encompassed round, the royal spinster full employed, he found... Then cried a while from work, My daughter, rest. And like a mother, scarce her lips he pressed. Servants retire, 
nor secrets dare to hear, entrusted only to a daughter's ear. They swift obeyed, not one suspicious thought the secret which their mistress would be taught. Then he, since now no witnesses are near, behold the God who guides the various year, the world's vast eye of light the source serene, who all things sees, by whom are all things seen. Believe me, nymph, for I the truth have showed, thy charms have power to charm so great a God. Confused, she heard him his soft passion tell, and on the floor, untwirled, the spindle fell, still, from the sweet confusion some new grace blushed out by stealth and languished in her face. The lover now inflamed himself but on, and out at once the god all radiant shone. The virgin startled at his altered form, too weak to bear a god's impetuous storm, no more against the dazzling youth she strove, but silently yielded and indulged his love. This glighty knew and knew she was undone, whose soul was fixed and doted on the sun. She raged to think on her neglected charms, and Phoebus panting in another's arms, with envious madness fired, she flies in haste, and tells the king his daughter was unchaste. The king, incensed to hear his honor stained, no more the father nor the man retained, in vain she stretched her arms and turned her eyes to her loved God, the enlightener of the skies. In vain she owned it was a crime, yet still it was a crime not acted by her will. The brutal sire stood deaf to every prayer, and deep in earth entombed alive the fair. What Phoebus could do was by Phoebus done. Full on her grave with pointed beams he shone, to pointed beams the gaping earth gave way had the nymph's eyes her eyes had seen the day but lifeless now yet lovely still she lay not more the god wept when the world was fired and in the wreck his blooming boy expired the vital flame he strives to light again and warm the frozen blood in every vein but since resistless fates denied that power on the cold nymph he rained a nectar shower and, undeserving thus, he said to die, yet still, in odors thou shalt reach the sky. The body soon dissolved, and all around, perfumed with heavenly fragrances, the ground a sacrifice for gods uprose from thence, a sweet, delightful tree, a frankincense. The Transformation of Clytie Thou guilty Clytie thus the sun betrayed, by too much passion she was guilty, made excess of love begot excess of grief. Grief fondly bade her hence to hope relief, but angry Phoebus hears unmoved her sighs, and scornful from her loathed embraces flies. All day, all night, in trackless wilds alone she pined, and taught the listening rocks her moan. On the bare earth she lies, her bosom bare, loose her attire, dishevelled is her hair. Nine times the morn unbarred the gates of light, as oft were spread the alternate shades of night. So long no sustenance the mourner knew, unless she drunk her tears or sucked the dew. She turned about but rose not from the ground, turned to the sun still as he rolled his round. On his bright face hung her desiring eyes, Till fixed to earth she strove in vain to rise. Her looks their paleness in a flower retained, But here and there some purple streaks they gained. Still the loved object the fond leaves pursue, Still move their root, the moving sun to view, And in the heliotrope the nymph is true. The sisters heard these wonders with surprise, but what received them as romantic lies, and pertly rallied that they could not see in powers divine so vast an energy. What owned true gods such miracles might do, but, oh, not Bacchus, one among the true, at last a common just request they make, and beg, Elsa, though, her turn to take. I will, she said, and please you if I can, then shot her shuttle swift. And thus began. The fate of Daphnis is a fate too known, when an enamoured nymph transformed to stone, because she feared another nymph might see the lovely youth, and love as much as she. So strange the madness is of jealousy, nor shall I tell you what changes Scython made. 
and how he walked a man or tripped a maid, you too would peevish frown, and patience want to hear how Selmis grew an adamant. He once was dear to Jove, and saw of old Jove when a child, but what he saw he told. Crocus and Smilax may be turned to flowers, and curities spring from bounteous showers. I pass a hundred legends stale as these, and with sweet novelty your taste will please. The story of Salmasis and Hermaphroditus. How Salmasis with weak and fling stream softens the bodies and unnerves the limbs, and what the secret cause shall here be shown. The cause is secret, but the effect is known. The naiads nursed an infant heretofore that Cytheria once to Hermes bore. From both the illustrious authors of his race the child was named, nor was it hard to trace both the bright parents through the infant's face. When fifteen years in Ida's cool retreat the boy had told, he left his native seat and sought fresh fountains in a foreign soil. The pleasure lessened the attending toil with eager steps. The Lycian fields he crossed, a river here and he viewed so lovely bright. It showed the bottom in a fairer light. Nor kept a sand concealed from human sight. The stream produced nor slimy ooze, nor weeds, nor miry rushes, nor spiky reeds, but dealt enriching moisture all around, the fruitful banks with cheerful verdure crowned, and kept the spring eternal on the ground. A nymph presides, not practiced in the chase, nor skillful at the bow, nor at the race. Of all the blue-eyed daughters of the main, the only stranger to Diana's train, her sisters often, as tis said, would cry, Fie, Salmasis, what? Always idle, fie! Or take thy quiver or thy arrows seize, and mix the toils of hunting with thy ease. Nor quiver nor arrow she e'er would seize, nor mix the toils of hunting with her ease. But oft would bathe her in the crystal tide, oft with a comb her dewy locks divide. Now in the limpid streams she views her face, and dressed her image in the floating glass. On beds of leaves she now reposed her limbs, now gathered flowers that grew about her streams, and then by chance was gathering as he stood to view the boy, and longed for what she viewed. Fain would she meet the youth with hasty feet. She fain would meet him, but refused to meet, before her looks were set with nicest care, and well deserved to be reputed fair. Bright youth, she cries, whom all thy features prove a god, and if a god, the god of love. But if a mortal bless thy nurse's breast, blessed are thy parents and thy sisters blessed. But oh, how blessed, how more than bless thy bride, a light in bliss. If any yet a lied, if so, let mine the stolen enjoyments be. If not, behold a willing bride in me. The boy knew not of love, and touched with shame. He strove and blushed, but still the blush became in rising blushes still fresh. Beauties rose, the sunny side of fruit such blushes shows. And such the moon, when all her silver white turns in eclipses to a ruddy light. The nymph still begs, if not a nobler bliss, a cold salute at least, a sister's kiss. And now prepares to take the lovely boy between her arms. He innocently coy replies, Or leave me to myself alone, you rude, uncivil nymph, or I'll be gone. Fair stranger, then, says she, it shall be so. And for she feared his threat, she feigned to go, but hid within a covert's neighboring green. She kept him still in sight herself unseen. The boy now fancies all the danger o'er, and innocently sports about the shore. Playful and wanton to the stream he trips, and dips his foot, and shivers as he dips. The coolness pleased him, and with eager haste his airy garments on the banks he cast, his godlike features and his heavenly hue, and all his beauties were exposed to view, his naked limbs the nymph with rapture spies, while hotter passions in her bosom rise, flush in her cheeks and sparkle in her eyes. 
She longs, she burns to clasp him in her arms and looks and sighs and kindles at his charms. Now all undressed upon the banks he stood and clapped his sides and leaped into the flood. His lovely limbs the silver waves divide. His limbs appear more lovely through the tide. As lilies shut within a crystal case receive a glossy luster from the glass. He's mine, he's all mine, the naiad cries and flings off all and after him she flies. And now she fastens on him as he swims and holds him close and wraps about his limbs. The more the boy resisted and was coy, the more she clipped and kissed the struggling boy. So when the wriggling snake it snatched on high in eagle's claws and hisses in the sky, around the foe his twirling tail he flings and twists her legs and writhes about her wings. The restless boy still obstinately strove to free himself and still refused her love. Amidst his limbs she kept her limbs entwined. And why, coy youth, she cries, why thus unkind? Oh, may the gods thus keep us ever joined. Oh, may we never, never part again. So prayed the nymph, nor did she pray in vain, for now she finds him as his limbs she pressed, grow nearer still and nearer to her breast, till piercing each other's flesh they run together and incorporate in one. Last in one face are both their faces joined, and when the stock and grafted twig combined shoot up the same and wear a common rind, both bodies in a single body mix, a single body with a double sex. The boy, thus lost in woman, now surveyed the river's guilty stream, and thus he prayed, he prayed, but wondered at his softer tone, surprised to hear a voice, but half his own. You parent gods, whose heavenly names I bear, hear your hermaphrodite and grant my prayer. O oh, grant that whomsoever these streams contain, if man he entered, he may rise again, supple, unsinewed, and but half a man. The heavenly parents answered from on high, their two-shaped son, the double votary, then gave a secret virtue to the flood, and tinged its source to make his wishes good. Alcetho and her sisters transformed to bats. But my niece's daughters still their tasks pursue to wickedness most obstinately true. At Bacchus still they laugh when all around unseen the timbrel's horse were heard to sound. Saffron and myrrh their fragrant odor shed. And now the present deity they dread. Strange to relate. Here ivy first was seen along the distaff crept the wondrous green. Then sudden springing vines began to bloom, and the soft tendrils curled around the loom, while purple clusters dangling from on high tinged the wrought purple with a second dye. Now from the skies was shot a doubtful light, the day declining to the bounds of night. The fabric's firm foundations shake all awe. False tigers rage and figured lions roar. Torches aloft seem blazing in the air, and angry flashes of red lightnings glare. To dark recesses the dire sight to shun. Swift, the pale sisters in confusion run. Their arms were lost in pinions as they fled, and subtle films each slender limb o'erspread. Their altered forms, their senses soon revealed, their forms how altered, darkness still concealed. Close to the roof each wandering upward springs. Born on unknown, transparent, plumeless wings. They strove for words. Their little bodies found no words, but murmured in a fainting sound in towns, not woods, the sooty bat's delight, and never till the dusk begin their flight, till Vesper rises with his evening flame, and from whom the Romans have derived their name. The transformation of Aino and Melicerta to see gods. The power of Bacchus now o'er Thebes had flown, with awful reverence soon the god they own. Proud, I know, all around the wonder tells, and on her nephew deity still dwells, of numerous sisters. She alone yet knew, no grief but grief, which she from sisters drew. Imperial Juno saw her with disdain, vain in her offspring, in her consort vain who ruled the trembling Thebans with a nod, but saw her vainest in her foster god. 
Could then, she cried, a bastard boy have power to make a mother her own son devour? Could he, the Tuscan crew, to fishes change, and now three sisters damned to forms so strange? Yet shall the wife of Jove find no relief? Shall she still, unrevenged, disclose her grief? Have I the mighty freedom to complain? Is that my power? Is that to ease my pain? A foe has taught me vengeance, and who ought to scorn that vengeance which a foe has taught? What short destruction frantic rage can throw, the gaping wounds of slaughtered Pentheus show? Why should not I know, fired with madness, stray like her mad daughters, her own kindred slay? Why she not follow where they lead the way? Down a steep, yawning cave, where yews displayed in arches meet and lend a baleful shade, through silent labyrinths a passage lies to mournful regions and infernal skies. Here Styx exhales its noisome clouds, and here, the funeral rites once paid, all souls appear, stiff, cold, in horror, with a ghastly face, and staring eyes infest the dreary place. Ghosts, new arrived, and strangers to these plains, know not the palace where grim Pluto reigns. They journey doubtful, nor the road can tell what leads to the metropolis of hell. A thousand avenues those towers command, a thousand gates forever open stand, as all the rivers disembogued find room for all their waters in an old ocean's womb. So this vast city worlds of shades receives, and space for millions still of worlds she leaves. The embodied specters freely rove and show whatever they loved on earth they love below. The lawyers still, or right or wrong, support the courtiers, smoothly guide to Pluto's court. Still airy heroes thought of glory fire, still the dead poet strings his deathless lyre, and lovers still with fancied darts expire. The queen of heaven, to gratify her hate, and soothe immortal wrath, forgets her state. Down from the realms of day to the realms of night, the goddess swift precipitates her flight. At hell arrived, the noise hell's porter heard, the enormous dog his triple head upreared. Thrice from three grisly throats he howled profound, then suppliant couched and stretched along the ground. The trembling threshold, which Saturnia pressed, the weight of each divinity confessed. Before a lofty adamantine gate, which closed a tower of brass, the fury sate, misshapen forms, tremendous to the sight, the implacable foul daughters of the night, a sounding whip each bloody sister shakes, or from her tresses combs the curling snakes. But now great Juno's majesty was known, through the thick gloom all heavenly bright she shone. The hideous monsters their obedience showed, and rising from their seats, submissive, bowed. This is the place of woe. Here groan the dead. Huge Titus, o'er nine acres here is spread. Fruitful for pain, the immortal liver breeds, still grows, and still the insatiate vulture feeds. Poor Tantalus to taste the water tries, but from his lips the faithless water flies. Then thinks the bending tree he can command. The tree starts backwards and eludes his hand. The labor, too, of Sisyphus is vain. Up the steep mount he heaves the stone with pain. Down from the summit rolls the stone again. The Bellides, their leaky vessels, still are ever filling and yet never fill. Doomed to this punishment for blood they shed, for bridegroom slaughtered in the bridal bed, stretched on the rolling wheel, Iaxion lies. Himself he follows, and himself he flies. Iaxion tortured Juno sternly eyed, and then turned and toiling, Sisyphus espied, and why, she said, so wretched is the fate of him, whose brother proudly reigns in state. Yet still my altars unadored have been by Athamus and his presumptuous queen. What caused her hate, the goddess thus confessed, what caused her journey now was more than guessed, that hate relentless is revenge did want, and that revenge the Furies soon could grant. They could the glory of proud Thebes efface, 
and hide and ruin the Cadmian race. For this she largely promises and treats, and to entreaties adds imperial threats. Then fell Tisiphone, with rage was stung, and from her mouth the untwisted serpents flung. To gain this trifling boon there is no need. She cried in formal speeches to proceed. Whatever thou commandest to do is done. Believe it finished, though not yet begun. But from these melancholy seats repair to happier mansions and to purer air. She spoke, the goddess, darting upwards flies, and joyous reascends her native skies, nor entered there till round her iris through ambrosial sweets and poured celestial dew. The faithful fury, guiltless of delays, with cruel haste the dire command obeys. Girt in a bloody gown, a torch she shakes, and round her neck twine speckled wreaths of snakes. Fear and dismay and agonizing pain, with frantic rage, complete her loveless train. To Thebes her flight she sped, and hell forsook at her approach the Theban turrets shook. The sun shrunk back, thick clouds the day o'er cast, and springing greens were withered as she passed. Now dismal yellings heard strange spectres seen, confound as much the monarch as the queen. In vain to quit the palace they prepared, Tisiphone was there and kept the ward. She wide extended her unfriendly arms, and all the fury lavished all her harms. Part of her tresses loudly hiss, and part spread poison as their forky tongues they dart. Then from her middle locks two snakes she drew, whose merit from superior mischief grew. The envenomed ruined, thrown with spiteful care, clung to the bosoms of the hapless pair. The hapless pair soon with wild thoughts were fired, and madness by a thousand ways inspired. Tis true, the unwounded body still was sound, but twas the soul which felt the deadly wound. Nor did the unsated monster give here o'er, but dealt of plagues a fresh, unnumbered store. Each baneful juice too well she understood, foam churned by Cerberus and Hydra's blood, hot hemlock and cold aconite she chose, delighted in variety of woes, whatever can untune the harmonious soul and its mild reasoning faculties control. Give false ideas, raise desires profane, and whirl in eddies the tumultuous brain. Mixed with cursed art, she direfully around through all their nerves diffused the sad compound, then tossed her torch in circles still the same, improved their rage and added flame to flame. The grinning fury her own conquest spied, and to her rueful shades returned with pride and threw the exhausted useless snakes aside. Now, Athamis cries out, his reason fled. Here, fellow hunters, let the toils be spread. I saw a lioness in quest of food with her two young, run roaring in this wood. Again, the fancied savages were seen, as through his palace still he chased his queen. Then tore Lercus from her breast, the child stretched little arms, and on its father smiled, a father now no more, who now begun around his head to whirl his giddy son, and quite insensible to nature's call, the helpless infant flung against the wall. The same mad poison in the mother wrought, young Melicerta in her arms she caught, and with disordered tresses howling flies. O oh, Bacchus, Evo, Bacchus, loud she cries, the name of Bacchus Juno laughed to hear, and said, Thy foster god has cost thee dear. A rock there stood, whose side the beating waves had long consumed, and hollowed into caves. The head shot forwards in a bending steep and cast a dreadful covert o'er the deep. The wretched Ino, on destruction bent, climbed up the cliff, such strength her fury lent. Thence with her guiltless boy she wept in vain. At one bold spring she plunged into the main. 
her niece's fate touched, Cytheria's breast, and in soft sound she Neptune thus addressed. Great god of waters, whose extended sway is next to his, whom heaven and earth obey, let not the suit of Venus thee displease. Pity the floaters on the Ionian seas, increase thy subject gods, nor yet disdain to add my kindred to that glorious train, if from the sea I may such honors claim. If tis desert that from the sea I came, as Grecian poets artfully have sung, and in the name confessed from whence I sprung. Pleased Neptune nodded his assent, and free both soon became from frail mortality. He gave them form and majesty divine, and bade them glide along the foamy brine. For Melicerta is Palamon known, and I know once. Lucatho is grown. The transformation of the Theban matrons. The Theban matrons their loved queen pursued, and tracing to the rock, her footsteps viewed. Too certain of her fate, they rend the skies with piteous shrieks and lamentable cries. All beat their breasts, and Juno all upbraid, who still remembered a deluded maid, who, still revengeful for one stolen embrace, thus wreaked her hate on the Cadmian race. This Juno heard, and such elves, she cried, dispute my justice or my power deride. You too shall feel my wrath not idly spent. A goddess never for insults was meant. She who loved most, and who most loved had been, said, not the wave shall part me from my queen. She strove to plunge into the roaring flood, fixed to the stone, a stone herself, she stood. This on her breast would fain her blows repeat. Her stiffened hands refused her breast to beat. That stretched her arms unto the sea. In vain her arms she labored to unstretch again. To tear her comely locks another tried. Both comely locks and fingers petrified. Part thus, but Juno with a softer mind, part doomed to mix among the feathered kind. Transformed, the name of Theban birds they keep and skim the surface of that fatal deep. Cadmus and his queen transformed to serpents. Meantime, the wretched Cadmus mourns, nor knows that they who mortal fell, immortal rose, with a long series of new ills oppressed. He droops, and all the man forsakes his breast. Strange prodigies confound his frighted eyes. From the fair city from which he raised, he flies as if misfortune not pursued his race, but only hung o'er that devoted place. Resolved by sea to seek some distant land at last, he safely gained the Illyrian strand. Cheerless himself, consort still he cheers, hoary and loaden both with woes and years. Then to recount past sorrows they begin, and trace them to the gloomy origin. That serpent sure was hollowed, Cadmus cried, which once my spear transfixed with foolish pride, when the big teeth a seed before unknown by me along the wandering glebe were sown, and sprouting armies by themselves o'erthrown. If thence the wrath of heaven on me is bent, may heaven conclude it with one sad event, to an extended serpent change the man, and while he spoke, the wish for change began. His skin, with sea-green spots, was varied round. And on his belly, prone, he pressed the ground. He glittered soon with many a golden scale, and his shrunk legs closed in a spiry tail. Arms yet remained, remaining arms he spread to his loved wife, and human tears yet shed. Come, my harmonia, come. Thy face reclined down to my face, still touch what still is mine. Oh, let these hands, while hands, be gently pressed. While yet the serpent has not all possessed. More he had spoke, but strove to speak in vain. The forky tongue refused to tell his pain, and learned in hissings only to complain. Then shrieked Harmonia, Stay, my Cadmus, stay! Glide not in such a monstrous shape away. Destruction like impetuous waves rolls on. Where are thy feet, thy legs, thy shoulders gone? Changes thy visage, changes all thy frame. Cadmus is only Cadmus now in name. 
Oh, ye gods, my Cadmus to himself restore, or me like him transform, I ask no more. The husband serpent showed he still had thought, with wanted fondness and embrace he sought, played round her neck in many a harmless twist, and licked that bosom, which a man he kissed. The lookers-on for lookers-on there were, Shocked at the sight, half died away with fear. The transformation was again renewed, and like the husband changed the wife they viewed. Both serpents now, with fold involved in fold, to the next covert amicably rolled. There curled they lie, or wave along the green. Fearless see men by men are fearless seen, still mild and conscious what they once have been. The story of Perseus. Yet though this harsh and glorious fate they found, each in the deathless grandson lived renowned. Through conquered India, Bacchus nobly rode, and Greece with temples hailed the conquering god. In Argos, only proud, Acrisius reigned, who all the consecrated rites profaned. Audacious wretch! Thus Bacchus to deny, and the great thunderer's great son defy, nor him alone. Thy daughter vainly strove, brave Perseus, of celestial stem to prove, and herself pregnant by a golden Jove. Yet this was true, and truth in time prevails. Acrisius now his unbelief bewails. His former thought and impious thought he found, and both the hero and the god were owned. He saw already one in heaven was placed, and one with more mortal triumphs graced. The victor Perseus with the gorgon hid, o'er Libyan sands his airy journey sped. The gory drops distilled as swift he flew, and from each drop envenomed serpents grew. The mischiefs brooded on the barren plains, and still the unhappy fruitfulness remains. Atlas transformed to a mountain. Thence, Perseus like a cloud by storms was driven through all the expanse beneath the cope of heaven. The jarring winds unable to control, he saw the southern and the northern pole, and eastward thrice and westward thrice was whirled, and from the skies surveyed the netherworld. But when grey evening showed the verge of night, he feared in darkness to pursue his flight. He poised his pinions and forgot to soar, and sinking, closed them on the Hesperian shore. Then begged to rest, till Lucifer begun to wake the morn, the morn to wake the sun. Here Atlas reigned, of more than human size, and in his kingdom the world's limit lies. How Titan bids his wearied courser sleep, and cools the burning axle in the deep, the mighty monarch, uncontrolled alone. His scepter sways. No neighboring states are known. A thousand flocks on shady mountains fed. A thousand herds o'er grassy plains were spread. Here wondrous trees their shining stores unfold. Their shining stores too wondrous to be told. Their leaves, their branches, and their apples gold. Then Perseus The gigantic prince addressed, humbly implored a hospital rest. If bold exploits thy admiration fire, he said, I fancy mine thou wilt admire. Or, if the glory of a race can move, not mean my glory, for I spring from Jove. At this confession Atlas ghastly stared, mindful of what an oracle declared, that the dark womb of time concealed a day which should disclose the bloomy gold betray. All should at once be ravished from his eyes, and Jove's own progeny enjoy the prize. For this, the fruit he loftily immured, and a fierce dragon the straight pass secured. For this, all strangers he forbade to land and drove them from the inhospitable strand. To Perseus then, fly quickly, fly this coast, nor falsely dare thy axe and race to boast. In vain the hero for one night entreats, threatening he storms, and next adds force to threats. By strength not Perseus could himself defend, for who in strength with Atlas could contend? But 
nights and short rest to me thou wilt not give. A gift of endless rest from me receive, he said, and backward turned no more concealed the present, and Medusa's head revealed. Soon, the high atlas, a high mountain stood, his locks and beard became a leafy wood. His hands and shoulders into ridges went, the summit head still crowned the steep ascent. His bones a solid rocky hardness gained. He thus immensely grown, as fate ordained, the stars, the heavens, and all the gods sustained. Andromeda rescued from the sea monster. Now, Aeolus had with strong chains confined and deep imprisoned every blustering wind. The rising phosphor with a purple light did sluggish mortals to new toils invite. His feet again, the valiant Perseus plumes, and his keen sabre in his hand resumes, then nobly spurns the ground and upwards springs, and cuts the liquid air with sounding wings, o'er various seas and various lands he passed, till Ethiopia's shore appeared at last. Andromeda was there, doomed to atone by her own ruin, follies not her own. And if injustice in a god can be, such was the Libyan god's unjust decree. Chained to a rock she stood, young Perseus stayed, his rapid flight to view the beauteous maid. So sweet her frame, so exquisitely fine, she seemed a statue by a hand divine. Had not the wind her waving tresses showed, and down her cheeks the melting sorrows flowed, her faultless form the hero's bosom fires. The more he looks, the more he still admires. The admirer almost had forgot to fly, and swift ascended, fluttering from on high. O oh, virgin worthy, no such change to prove, but pleasing chains in the soft folds of love. Thy country and thy name, he said, disclose, and give a true rehearsal of thy woes. A quick reply her bashfulness refused. To the free converse of a man unused, her rising blushes had concealment found from her spread hands. But that her hands were bound. She acted to her full extent of power and bathed her face with a fresh silent shower. But by degrees, in innocence grown bold, her name, her country, and her birth she told, and how she suffered for her mother's pride, who with the Nereids once in beauty vied, part yet untold, the seas began to roar, and mounting billows tumbled to the shore. Above the waves a monster raised his head, his body o'er the deep was widely spread. Onward he flounced, aloud the virgin cries, each parent to her shrieks and shrieks replies. But she had deepest cause to rend the skies. Weeping to her they cling, no sign appears of help. They only lend their helpless tears. Too long you vent your sorrows, Perseus said. Short is the hour and swift the time of aid. In me the son of thundering Jove behold, God in a kindly shower of fruitful gold. Medusa's snaky head is now my prey, and through the clouds I boldly wing my way. If such desert be worthy of esteem, and if your daughter I from death redeem, shall she be mine? Shall it not then be thought a bride so lovely was too cheaply bought? For my arms I willingly employ, if I may beauties, which I save and joy. The parents eagerly the terms embrace, for who would slight such terms in such a case? Nor her alone they promise, but beside the dowry of a kingdom with the bride. A well-rigged galleys which slaves sweating now with their sharp beaks, the whitened ocean plough. So when the monster moved, still at his back, the furrowed waters left a foamy track. Now to the rock he was advanced so nigh, whirled from a sling a stone, the space would fly. Then bounding upwards the brave Perseus sprung, and in midair on hovering pinions hung. His shadow quickly floated on the main, the monster could not his wild rage restrain, but at the floating shadow leaped in vain. As when Jove's bird a speckled serpent spies, which in the shine of Phoebus basking lies, unseen, he souses down and bears away trust from behind the vainly hissing prey. To writhe his neck the labor naught avails, too deep the imperial talons pierce its scales. Thus the winged hero now descends, now soars, and at his pleasure the vast 
monster gores, full in his back, swift stooping from above. The crooked saber to its hilt he drove. The monster raged, impatient of the pain, first bounded high and then sunk low again. Now like a savage boar when chafed with wounds and bayed with open mouths of hungry hounds, he on the foe turns with collected might, who still eludes him with an airy flight and wheeling round the scaly armor tries of his thick sides, his thinner toll now plies, till from repeated strokes out gushed a flood and the waves reddened with the streaming blood. At last the dropping wings befoamed all o'er, with flaggy heaviness their master bore. A rock he spied whose humble head was low, bare at an ebb but covered at a flow. A ridgy hold he thither flying gained, and with one hand his bending weight sustained, with the other vigorous blows he dealt round and the home thrust the expiring monster owned. In deafening shouts the glad applauses rise, and peal on peal runs rattling through the skies. A savior youth, the royal pair confess, and with heaved hands their daughter's bridegroom bless. The beauteous bride moves on, now loosed from chains, the cause and sweet reward of all the hero's pains. Meantime, on shore, Triumphant Perseus stood and purged his hands smeared with the monster's blood. Then in the windings of a sandy bed composed Medusa's execrable head. But to prevent the roughness leaves he threw and young green twigs which soft in waters grew. There soft and full of sap but here when laid touched by the head that softness soon decayed. The wanted flexibility quite gone, the tender scions hardened into stone, fresh juicy twigs surprised the nereids bought, fresh juicy twigs the same contagion caught, the nymphs the petrifying seeds still keep, and propagate the wonder through the deep, the pliant sprays of coral yet declare their stiffening nature when exposed to air, those sprays which did like bending osiers move, snatched from their element obdurate prove, and shrubs beneath the waves grow stones above. The great immortals grateful Perseus praised, and to three powers three turfy altars raised. To Hermes this, and that he did assign. To Pallas, the mid-honours, Jove were thine. He hastes for Pallas a white cow to cull, a calf for Hermes, but for Jove a bull, then seized the prize of his victorious fight, Andromeda, and claimed the nuptial rite. Andromeda alone he greatly sought, the dowry kingdom was not worth his thought. Pleased, Hymen now his golden torch displays, with rich oblations fragrant altars blaze, sweet wreaths of choicest flowers are hung on high, and cloudless pleasures smile in every eye, the melting music melting thoughts inspires, and warbling songsters aid the warbling lyres. The palace opens wide, in pompous state, and by his peers surrounded, Cepheus sate. A feast was served, fit for a king to give, and fit for godlike heroes to receive. The banquet ended, the gay, cheerful bowl moved round and brightened, and enlarged each soul. Then Perseus asked what customs there obtained, and by what laws the people were restrained, which told the teller a like freedom takes, and to the warrior his petition makes to know what arts had won Medusa's snakes. The Story of Medusa's Head The hero with his just request complies, shows how a veil beneath cold Atlas lies, where with aspiring mountains fenced around, he, the two daughters of old Forcus, found. Fate had one common eye to both assigned. Each saw by turns, and each by turns was blind. But while one strove to lend her sister sight, he stretched his hand and stole their mutual light and left both eyeless, both involved in night. Through devious wilds and trackless woods he passed and at the Gorgon seats arrived at last. 
but as he journeyed, pensive he surveyed what wasteful havoc dire Medusa made. Here stood still breathing statues, men before. There rampant lions seemed in stone to roar. Nor did he yet affrighted quit the field, but in the mirror of his polished shield reflected saw Medusa slumbers take, and not one serpent by good chance awake. Then backward, an unerring blow he sped, and from her body lopped at once her head. The gore prolific proved, with sudden force sprung Pegasus, and winged his airy course. The heaven-born warrior faithfully went on, and told the numerous dangers which he run, what subject seized, what lands he had in view, and nigh what stars the adventurous hero flew. At last he silent sate, the listening throng sighed at the pause of his delightful tongue. Some begged to know why this alone should wear, of all the sisters, such destructive hair. Great Perseus then, with me you shall prevail, worth the relation to relate a tale. Medusa once had charms to gain her love, a rival crowd of envious lovers strove. They who have seen her own, they ne'er did trace more moving features in a sweeter face. Yet, above all, her length of hair they own, in golden ringlets waved and graceful shone. Her Neptune saw, and with such beauties fired, resolved to compass what his soul desired. In chaste Minerva's fane he lustful stayed, and seized and rifled the young blushing maid. The bashful goddess turned her eyes away, nor durst such bold impurity survey, but on the ravished virgin vengeance takes. Her shining hair is changed to hissing snake. These in her aegis palace joys to bear. The hissing snakes, her foes, more sure and snare than they did lovers once, when shining hair. <laughs>